and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. First up, his moral alignment test results just came back and he is definitely chaotic good. It's Matt Morgan. So, Joey, I have a question for you. Why is it that fingers are the most reliable part of your body? Something something fingerprints? I'm not sure, Matt. Why? No. No. It's because you can always count on them. <laughs> <laughs> They're so reliable, dependable I, even. That's that's exceptionally good. I know there's a dad joke coming every week and you always manage to find it. I, I, I will point you in the right direction for the answer. Listeners, you can't see my face right now, but it just fell. It's that's... very, very angry. Very, very disappointed. <laughs> well done, Matt. Up next, his moral alignment test also came back and... His results came back as lawful neutral milk hotel. That's Dana Roach. <laughs> wow, Joey, well played. You, uh, yeah, hey. that's, I am a uh, yeah for sure. Um, <laughs> I just got my first look at some of the new spoilers from Midnight Hunt, and if someone doesn't alter that night and day token to a nightman and dayman token, I'm gonna be very very disappointed. Oh, we um, we already have Elspeth champion the sun. Um, and to fairy master of time and friendship for everyone. So we just need the Nightman and Day Man now and we're good to go. I love where this is going. This is Dana. perfect. <laughs> uh, Matt, I'm glad that you get it because this went right over my head, but that's completely okay. Anyway, this is the EDH RecCast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we like to do is give all of that data a little more context. Hey, Dana, what is it that we're talking about in this week's episode? We are going to talk about protecting the board. Protecting the board. This was a topic that you pitched, and I at first thought, I'm like, I don't know, is there really that much to say about this topic? And it turns out, yeah, there are a lot of really important ways to protect the board state that you've got to make sure that you can keep your winning position in a game of EDH, because that can be the final, you know, last lap that gets you to victory. So this is going to be a whole lot of fun. I'm really excited to talk about it. Real quick, before we get to our main topic, let's pause and thank the folks at the Command Zone for handling all of the post-production work on the podcast, making it look as awesome as it does. And we want to thank our sponsors for the show, too. Uh, yeah, the EDH Trackcast is sponsored by Card Kingdom and a TCG player, the uh, Midnight Hunt and Crimson Vow of online card shops. <laughs> <laughs> Just go to EDH Rec and click on the card in question. Um, choose the vendor link down below, and doing that supports both the site and the show. And if you prefer to support the show directly, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. We have patron tiers of all sorts of levels. We have a patron-only Discord. We have everything that you're looking for in a awesome, awesome Patreon website support way um, <laughs> just head over to patreon.com slash edh retcast um, you can support the show directly and we even have that a very special tier actually uh, where we say thanks to a patron just for supporting us so this week we want to give a shout out to jd umberson thank you so much um quite the umbrage to make your ado um, what and now uh um Joey, t t take me out of here. But thank you, thank you, JD, is what I want to say. Th thank you, JD Umberson. We do not take umbrage with your support. We are very happy for your support. I'm going to be honest. I don't know what that word means, but I've heard it said a couple times. <laughs> All right. I think we're in a weird energy right now, so this should make the show a whole lot of fun. Let's get into our main topic, fellas. We are talking about protecting the board state, making sure that the stuff you've got on board is the stuff that you're going to be able to keep on board. Dana, you pitched this episode. Why is this such an important topic for us to discuss when it comes to playing Commander? I think it's one of those things that you maybe don't think about right away when you start brewing Commander decks and start playing Commander. Um, and part of the reason, I think, is particularly because of blue. Um, you know, hmm. I, I myself had that thought before, like, well, I, I can just use blue counter spells to save my stuff, uh, you know, whenever I need to worry about it. The beauty of protecting your board a lot of times, though, is you're not just stopping a thing from going off. You're allowing a thing to go off and affect everybody else while not affecting mm. you. And I think that's oftentimes the real strength of, of protecting your board. You know, sometimes it's just a single target thing. But like a lot of times, the beauty of it is you get to dodge an effect that hits everybody else when the person casting it was hoping they could just start the game over, kind of. Yeah, well, like Dana said, like a lot of times people just kind of default to, well, I'll just find a commander that has blue in it and play some counter spells to protect everything. But really, like 
you don't need to do that anymore. There's there's <laughs> plenty of ways in literally every single color. There's some sort of way to protect either your entire board or those key pieces that you need to keep around in order to make sure you're not losing mm -hmm. um, so that you can you know then go on to win the game possibly. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways. Every color kind of does it a little bit differently, but the common thing here is we want to make sure that people know what kind of cards you can be looking towards and why they're so impactful in doing these things like protecting your board states. Very, very much. Because Dana, as you mentioned, sometimes it is actually better not to use a counterspell in those situations so that you end up completely with the scales lopsided in your favor, even after a huge board wipe. So yeah, let's get into them. I think we're going to start off just in color order with the color white. Matt, do you want to start us off with some of your favorite board protecting spells in white and all of the different stuff that white is up to when it comes to keeping your stuff alive? Well, the best thing that white does is protecting its own board state. It may not have many things worth protecting sometimes. <laughs> it feels Ooh. but i will say okay. that when it when it comes to protecting what you already have on board um, white probably does this better than a lot of colors um, you have all sorts of options you have a chroma's will you have rootborn defenses unbreakable formation all sorts of ways of making your battlefield and specifically creatures indestructible that's kind of what white does the best um, there's the free spell, Flawless Maneuver, which you can cast as long as you have your commander in play. It's a great way of protecting your commander from a board wipe. Um, there's just so many ways within white that are going to give your board indestructible, which is so, so key when you're, you know, maybe getting alpha striked at and you have a bunch of blockers or you have to block um, or just board wipes. Cast a board wipe and, you know, cast Flawless Maneuver, protect all of your creatures. It's a great thing that white does. Well, and one thing I want to point out here about white in particular, Matt mentioned white does this really well and does a lot of it. It does it to the point where like almost every set at some point features a, you know, white instant speed common that gives a creature indestructible. Um, you know, just looking alphabetically even at the, at the, you know, 50 or 60 entries, if you search for a white indestructible instant, you have adamant will, which is a two mana one that gives creatures plus two plus two an indestructible or gives a target creature, I should say. Um, in white, there's so many of those that, that just do one target that it's not worth really getting into all of them, mm. particularly because there's ones like you mentioned, like Rootborn Defenses, that will protect your entire team. Um, whereas in other colors, we're probably going to at some point talk about ones that seem a little bit more narrow. But the difference is there's just not many options in other colors necessarily. So the, the more narrow spells seem a little more impactful there, whereas in white, you have just some absolute, I think Teferi's Protection the you know best protection <laughs> spell ever printed um so you have those options in white that are like absolute hammers versus other colors where you have to be much more picky to find ways to protect your stuff well yeah i, I wanted to, i wanted to leave teferi's protection for you dana i didn't i didn't want to take up all the creative <laughs> ones i got to softball it to somebody so yeah. man I, I it was a ticking time bomb for teferi's protection to be mentioned in this episode the card that shows up in over forty thousand decks gives all of your like phases all your stuff out gives you protection from stuff you're not going to change to it protects you in addition to your board, which makes it just absolutely amazing. But like, you know, we all know Teferi's protection. Another card that I want to shout out here for protecting your board is also that new Guardian of Faith. When it enters the battlefield, it's got flash. You can also phase out the other stuff that you've got. I think that's also like a really good contender, just like a lot of these indestructible cards will be good against, you know, a damnation or something like that. Guardian of Faith and Teferi's Protection are also really good against that, and they also are really good against the infamous Cyclonic Rift, because, I mean, phasing isn't going to touch them either, and if you do Cyclonic Rift when there's a Guardian of Faith out, you'll just get the Guardian of Faith right back in your hand so you can do it again on a later turn, which I think is awesome. Yeah, what's great about a lot of the really good white ones is they kind of can, can function offensively as well. You know, Guardian of Faith is, is on a body. And you can reuse it. it. It's a, it's something that people then have to bear in mind after you do it once. They have to bear that in mind for anything they do in the future. You've got that in hand. Um, Teferi's protection. I've used that offensively plenty of times when I know I am going to be able to win the game next turn and I don't want mm. anyone to interfere, you know, make me discard whatever until then. I'm just going to not participate in the game. I'm just going to like punch out for the, the next spinner on the board. Um, a chrome as well. We talked about, um, that is a great way to protect your 
Walter Board, but offensively, that thing is a powerhouse. Like that can just kill people as well. Yeah. So that's the beauty here of white and a lot of these effects in white. Um, not only can you use them to, to turn something into kind of a one sided effect defensively, but offensively, a lot of them are very strong. Well, yeah. And if, if you want to talk about putting these effects on creatures like with Guardian of Faith, a selfless spirit is one of my favorite onboard tricks, as, as Joey loves to, you know, point out my affinity for. Um, selfless spirit is just a great card. Like, it, mm -hmm. it's an early drop. It comes down. It's only two mana. You can just sacrifice it to make all your creatures indestructible. But also, like, it's a 2-1 flyer. Like, you can beat down with that. Um, you know, when push comes to shove, you need to save the board at instant speed. You know, Selfless Spirit is fantastic at that, and it's just a reusable body. You can bring it back with any sort of regrowth or reanimation effects. Like, this card is is so good. And if we're going to mention Guardian of Faith, like, I feel like we have to mention Selfless Spirit because it's it's just a card I want to put in any creature-based deck in general. Well, and I also feel like if we're going to bring up Selfless Spirit, we're probably obligated to also mention White as Avacyn, Angel of Hope, just giving all of your stuff indestructible. Like, that is a really huge creature to reanimate as well. I guess... You know, talking about Avacyn, even like the the quote unquote bad Avacyn, um, gives creatures protection from color, and white has a lot of things that do that as well. You, like you have a lot of ways um, to protect your creatures from effects just by like keeping them from being targeted by giving them pro colors. So there's quite a few effects. You know, obviously Mother of Ruins being the the most notable one, but like that kind of thing is a thing white does as well. So um, and, and that can also be used offensively to allow you to swing past blockers. Indeed, um, just the the utility in white is really nice. Well, and we also are going to be completely remiss if we don't bring up another really effective board protecting, but also really good utility effect here too, which is just the blink spells in white. Every interlude to temporarily blink all of your creatures away, ghost way to do the same. I think there's a new semester's end from uh, Strixhaven as well that does something similar. Like you can just have your creatures temporarily peace out, avoid a board wipe, and then come right back. And if you've got enters the battlefield effects for all of those. I mean, you can just use those even without a board wipe to get a whole bunch of stuff going right all over again. Yeah, it's very easy for white just to accrue a lot of value. The flickering, um, another strategy that I really like is kind of the, the faith's reward type of cards where you're able to oh. bring stuff back from the graveyard. Joey, that's something I hear you mm -hmm. may enjoy doing now and then, but you're able to do it in white. Like mm -hmm. um, say you need to you know, rebuild after a board wipe, stuff like Faith's Reward brought back, like those are going to be able to grab things out of your graveyard and bring them right back into play. Um, so it's a great way to just kind of instantly recover and get important pieces back. Oh yeah, Cosmic Intervention is another one that I really, really, really like because you can foretell it to make sure that you cast it cheap when you need it. And, and again, you can kind of use that as a ramp spell, as a way to recur <laughs> your fetch lands. It has some added utility aside from just as a way to protect your board. Oh, I didn't even know about that. That's... There you a go. little bit sneaky there, Dana. Yeah. That's really clever. And I'm, I'm sure that that sounds like we've probably hit all of the different things that white can do, right? Like there aren't any other tricks that you've got hidden up your sleeve in this category, <laughs> are there, Dana? There are a couple more. Uh, Laps oh, no. of Certainty, Mana Tithe, and <laughs> Dawn Charm, white's counter spells. Um, and I'm not sure any of those are would crack the top 300 best counter spells in blue. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if I'm exaggerating, that could be correct. However, they're not in blue, they're in white. <laughs> and the ability right. to drop a counter spell on someone in white is backbreaking sometimes. Like, <laughs> Laps of Certainty popped up on game nights, you know, a year or so ago and, and, and was absolutely disruptive. And whenever I've cast it in games or seen it cast in games, the look on people's faces and the impact on the board is. A, a, much more um, impressive than almost anything you see from a blue counter spell because no one's ever ready for it. Well, Lapse of Certainty, like if you compare it almost to Delay, which is like it sees a decent amount of play, about 6% of decks out there. Um, Lapse of Certainty is only played in about 5,000 decks, but like whenever you see it in like a Boros colored deck, you know, the red, white or Selesnia, it's not it, you, these decks aren't playing blue, so you're never going to expect a counter spell. And there's there's a whole category of cards that you know you don't see these effects very often in those colors. So when you do, they're insanely impactful. And mana tithing somebody who ex, you know spends all of their mana on some massive villainous wealth, like that's that's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> you're using a mana tithe, and it's countering something big. 
um, which doesn't always happen. Yeah, those are really, really awesome. And so, okay, now I think we've exhausted some of the stuff that white is up to. There are plenty more, but we got to move on to blue because we've been talking about counter spells for a while. So let's move now to the ways that blue can protect its board. And <laughs> yeah, a lot of the discussion that we'll have here is going to be around counter spells. You've got your traditional counter spell. You've got your free ones like fierce guardianship. You've got your like even a cheap negate is also going to do a ton of work for you because are you playing a fumigate across the board? No, I'm just going to counter it. Are you trying to play some huge board wipe? No, I'm just going to keep everyone's stuff here because I like the position the board is in. Those can come in super clutch. Dana, do you have any personal favorite counter spells? Um, you know, Matt mentioned delay. I, I do kind of like delay, actually, to be honest. I, I tend to like counter spells that only cost a single blue, um, in part because I run a lot of utility lands in my deck, so I don't <laughs> oftentimes have two blue mana free. Um, and, and whose fault is that? Yeah, that's that's not me. That's my that's <laughs> that's my fault. Um, but also, okay. like, I, I'm not really a control player either. I tend to use counter spells as a way to not lose the game. Like, I'm not trying to use them for tempo hits or anything. I'm just using them to stop an emergency. So, like, it's just much easier to keep that single swan song mana up or that single stubborn denial mana up than it is to. Uh you know, worry about double blue from a counter spell or, or more on some of the more expensive counter spells. Stubborn Denial is so dang good. Mm -hmm. The Ferocious Trigger, it's already met because that's what you're going to protect with your board anyway. You're going to use it against some type of like enemy wrath spell that would come for your board. Like, it's so the Ferocious Trigger, like it's all, the, I, I Stubborn Denial is like just my, it, it's my personal favorite. I, I do think like that's a thing about counter spells that, that people maybe miss a little bit is though what you're using your counters for in your deck can change from deck to deck to deck um, and from mm -hmm. person to person to person depending on your play style. And I do think people need to spend maybe a little more time thinking about like, what am I trying to protect in this deck? Because a lot of times it changes depending on what you're playing. It occurs to me that maybe we've alienated Matt from this part of the conversation because he doesn't really <laughs> play blue. You know, you know what? Um, I have some blue in decks. Not a lot, but some. <laughs> Accidentally. Um, but I, but yeah, it, it, it's not by choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, like I, I do, I do play counter spells every now and then. Um, one that I'm really a big fan of that I don't see a whole lot of play, even though it's like a five cent card is disdainful stroke. Um, mm -hmm. It's a single blue mana, but counters anything um, creature or non creature spells um, that cost four or greater. Which really, like you're in commander, like you're there. People are casting big powerful spells, so really it's just a more flexible negate in a lot of situations. Like yes, there's something small that's always going to sneak through. But I, man, Disdainful Stroke is usually like if if I'm playing that many counter spells in a deck, like the third or fourth counter spell that I will try to find room for. Um, well, I just think it's it's so good in Commander specifically. That's a really good example of specific counter spells depending on what you want to do. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I have a Sphinx Tribal deck that's really really greedy in terms of how much blue mana it uses. So that's one where I definitely don't like to have double blue um, in my counter spells. Mm -hmm. But the main thing I'm concerned about in that deck is board wipes because I don't want to try to recast those nine drop sphinxes um, and have to rebuild my board state with them. Whereas if I'm just using something like um, the Sinful Stroke, that's just a great way to stop anyone from wiping the board. It just stops any board wipe, basically. So the main concern in that deck is stopping that kind of thing from happening, which makes that a great spell there. Now, I do think it's important to mention that blue's only specialty when it comes to protecting your board isn't solely counter spells. There are some other tricks that it's got up its sleeve, and there's one that I feel like we gotta call out here, and that is a personal favorite of both Dana and me. That's the card Teferi's Veil. Whenever your creatures attack, at the end of combat, they will phase out, so they won't exist until your next turn. This is so stinking good to make sure that other people's sorcery speed board wipes are not going to touch your stuff. And they basically can only interact with your creatures on your own turn. This thing is nasty powerful and players should absolutely be using it because it's just so good. Yeah, where Teferi's Veil especially shines is in a deck maybe that's going wide or at least that has a lot of creatures that don't have static abilities that you care about. You know, if you're playing a deck with things that you want them in play to do a particular thing, even when they're not attacking, it maybe isn't that useful for you. But like, do you care if a bunch of your Talran tokens, for example, phase out? 
Like those aren't doing you any good tapped anyway. Um, mm. So you might as well protect them in case somebody board wipes next turn. Well, and one card that does pretty well at protecting your board, even though it may not necessarily protect the board you have right now, but more rebuilding your board afterwards um, is Synthetic Destiny. It's a card that was originally reprinted back in Commander 2015, but was reprinted um, in Call Time Commander. Um, and it's, man, it doesn't see a whole lot of play, um, but it's uh, four blue blue for an instant that says, uh, exile all creatures you control. And at the beginning of the next end step, you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal that many creature cards. And you put all those creature cards revealed this way onto the battlefield and shuffle the rest into your library. Um, so you may not get the exact board that you had, but you're getting exactly that many creatures back onto the battlefield after a Wrath of God. The timing on this one is is kind of why it, it's it's so powerful and a lot of people don't necessarily expect it coming out of a big blue spell like this. Yeah, six mana is probably what causes this to be a little bit lesser played, but if you've got even a handful of tokens and you'll eventually turn them into other big creatures that you want to have out anyway, I mean, that's why you put them in your deck, then I, I quite, I, this this would definitely catch me off guard. I, I really like what this spell is up to. Blue's slice of this color pie is not what I would call narrow because there's a gazillion counter spells, but it really is specifically focused on counter magic. Whereas when we move over to black, things get much more diverse, even if it maybe isn't as deep with the spells we care about. This is true. Black has a checkered history, as I guess how I'll say it, when it comes to saving the board, because <laughs> some of the most protective things that it's really got are just things that are going to get your board right back. For example, Micaeus the Unhallowed, he gives your stuff undying. So when they would die, they're just going to come right back with a plus one plus one counter on it. And so that's really great for death triggers. That's really great for enter the battlefield triggers. That's really, really cool. And there are also the occasional spells like Thrilling Encore that get back all of the creatures that died this turn and plop them right back onto your board. So you don't prevent the death from happening, but usually in the case of black, I mean, that's perfectly okay because we're probably going to get like a Blood Artist trigger or 17 when things die anyway so we don't mind just bringing everything right back even though there was an interim death in the middle of that whole process well and i'm a big fan in in some of my decks like my ukima and kazar deck um where you know ukima tends to die a little bit um, i really like cards like kaya's ghost form or malakir rebirth where yeah it, if you know Ukima's gonna die, I may as well just bring it right back to the battlefield because I would need it to die anyway for those the, the death triggers or leaving the battlefield triggers to happen anyways. So having these kind of quick reanimation things, at least on specific single target spells, um, Black does that pretty well. I, I also like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's there's sort of a pseudo reanimation thing going on there, Ish. but like- It's a I, reanimation I, adjacent. Right, but like also I do kind of feel that like, a form of quote protecting my board is that like if I've got like a Twilight's Call in my hand that's going to revive all of the creatures anyway, like I don't mind running a whole bunch of creatures out onto the battlefield because if they die, I know that I'm going to just get them right back next turn. So like mass reanimation is also kind of a way of keeping the huge lethal board state that you've got. It's it's kind of a double sided or, or excuse me a double prong card like some of the ones the white gets where you can use it defensively, but with sack elbows as prevalent as they are in in black. <laughs> Well, it's very yes. often you can use those effects offensively and having the option to do both is really, really useful. Can confirm. Everyone should play more Reanimator. It's absolutely <laughs> the best. The versatility is off the charts. Dana, do you have any other favorites? I, I have two that are kind of fun. Um, one is Dark Dabbling. It's an instant for two and a black, and it just says regenerate target creature and draw a card, which is kind of underwhelming. But if you have spell mastery, so if there are two or more instant or sorcery cards in your graveyard, regenerate each other creature you control. Um that's really easy to hit spell mastery in commander, especially unless someone just emptied graveyards. By the time anyone's blowing up the board, you're just going to hit spell mastery. It replaces itself and regenerates everything. Most of the time, that's going to save you from a board wipe. That's very, very useful. And, and if you go back a little bit further to Mirrodin, there's a card called Whale of the Nim for the same casting cost, hmm. also an instant, and it regenerates each creature you control. But it has Entwine, and the second ability is it deals one damage to each creature or player. So you can use it to, you know, if you need to clean out a token swarm or just spend one more mana to Entwine stuff and also save your stuff if you need to um, and do a little bit of damage to people. It's just a very versatile card that I'm 
a, a fan of, and I think it should see more play. So this isn't a this is kind of my bonus challenge. The stats pick is Whale the Man. <laughs> I mean, I, I do like it, but you know, keep in mind that Regenerate doesn't you know protect you from a classic Wrath of God yes. because Wrath of God does have the can't be regenerated clause on it. So that is something to keep in mind for sure. Yep. But that is still a pretty clever card. And now, Dana, what you just did right there was you mentioned having a bonus challenge the stats, but. I think that's a signal for us right now to pause and get into the actual Challenge the Stats segment of the show. It's one of our favorite things to do here on the podcast because there are so many cards on EDHREX, so much data, but we don't always agree with it. Sometimes I think that cards see either too much or too little play, so we love to challenge those statistics. And don't forget, folks, as always, Challenge the Stats is brought to you by altersleeves.com. So you can head over to altersleeves.com slash EDHRECcast. Um, that will let you know that we sent you over there. Um, they're a great website. If you want to bling out your decks, there's all sorts of different versions out there for cards. But if you want to change your mind, you want to try out different ones that suit you, Alter Sleeves lets you do that. All sorts of different art. You can slip over any of your magic cards. It's great. The sleeves are actually super high quality. I was so impressed the first time I saw them. So make sure you head over to altersleeves.com slash EDH Retcast uh, to pick up your Alter Sleeves. Yes, indeed. Thank you for sponsoring Challenge the Stats. And now, Matt, it's time for your challenge. Well, this week, actually, I don't have a challenge, but I do want to shout out a listener challenge that they submitted <laughs> um, because somebody went to patreon.com slash EDH Retcast and joined, and they're supporting us at the $2 level or more. Um, so Sparuda, I believe is how we're going to pronounce this, uh, the Doom of Depths, went to our Challenge the Stats channel and said they want to challenge standardize in Eureka lists. Um, currently standardize, which is a blue blue instant that says choose a creature type other than legend or wall, and each creature type becomes that type until end of turn. Well, challenging this in Eureka decks actually makes a lot of sense. Um, so Sparuda says uh, they're challenging it in Eureka lists. It only shows up in 28 decks. Um, it can turn all the creatures you control into ninjas. Um, probably not all Eureka decks want this card, but only 28 copies in Eureka decks seems very low to me. Um, well, Sparuda, I very much agree. Um, if you're playing any sort of go wide, you have a whole bunch of 1-1s, one and if you're playing tokens, um, any sort of deck like that, you're going to be able to draw a whole lot of cards with standardized out there because Eureka's ability cares about ninjas. So you just cast standardize, name ninjas, and you have a whole bunch of ninjas hitting opponents' triggers. It's real nasty. You're gonna draw a whole bunch of cards. You're gonna deal a whole bunch of damage probably. So yes, I, I do agree. Probably not every Eureka list wants standardize in there, but the decks that have any sort of go-wide capabilities, they definitely want this in there. That is a really, really interesting one. Eureka's got so many little unblockable cards that turning all of them into ninjas, that sounds really, really dangerous. I'm gonna move now to my challenge here. I've got a card that I think is being overplayed, but in very specific scenarios, the card Feed the Swarm, the two mana black sorcery that destroys target creature or enchantment and opponent controls, and then you lose life equal to its mana value, that is a great card for mono black, for Rakdos, or for Grixis. But you don't need it in a Golgari deck, and you don't need it in an Orzov deck, and yet it still continues to show up in a whole bunch of Golgari or Orzov, or even Obzon decks. For example, I'm looking right now at the page for Dina Soul Steeper, and Feed the Swarm is showing up in 25% of Dina's Soul Steeper decks. She doesn't need it. Green has access to enchantment removal already, and if you're using this to get rid of a creature, you could just be using better forms of removal. So this card is way overplayed. Don't use Feed the Swarm in Golgari decks specifically. Save this spell for your mono black decks or your Rakdos decks or Grixis or any of those other color combinations that have a lot harder time getting rid of enchantments. Well, my challenge of stats this week is for a, a creature from Corset 2021, um, Gadrak the Crown Scourge. Um, it's two in a row. Scourge? Scourge. 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 Gadrak the Crown Scourge. Um, <laughs> two in a red for a dragon. It's a 5-4 with flying. Um, Gadrak can't attack unless you control four or more artifacts, but the important part here is at the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token for each non-token creature that died this turn. Um, there's been a lot of treasure stuff being done um, since Forgotten Realms came out and added that much more treasure um, alongside Modern Horizons to the uh, EDH universe. 
But because this isn't part of that two-set cycle or it's not part of that original burst of treasure stuff way back in Ixalan, I think people kind of forget this card exists. It's only in 122 decks in EDH rec. Um, number one, it probably should be in more Lathless Dragon Queen decks. It's only in about a, about a third of those decks because it's just a three-mana way to make a 6-6 six, six and be a 5-4 that's probably going to accidentally be able to attack just because you have mana rocks in play. Um, but beyond that, that's a pretty good treasure maker in a treasure deck or even just in some kind of aristocrats deck where you're sacrificing stuff. Um, there, this card just has a lot of utility for a three-mana 5-4, and it should show up in more than like just over 100 lists, I think. Matt, this is weird. What happened to Dana? He's challenging a card that wasn't printed back in the year 2000. I know. I know. This is such a I'm new to card. Like, up. I, I thought Dana only plays cards that are old enough to vote. Like that's just <laughs> how I thought his his criteria was. Oh man. Okay, guys. You know, Dana, you mentioned a red card there, so let's get back into our discussion about protecting your board with the color red. We're talking about red's different ways to keep your stuff around, to keep all of that the, the big threatening board state that you've got. What are some tools in red, Dana, that you really, really like to use to make sure that your very threatening board gets to stay that way? Number one, the very obvious deflecting SWAT. Um, it's not going to save your board, but it's going to save the most important piece that you have in play, and it's going to redirect that over to take out the most important piece somebody else has. It's probably much more important in a you know combo deck or a Voltron deck or something where that singular piece is much more valuable than th the bunch of goblins that you have out in a Krenko deck or something. But in those decks, being able to save that stuff is invaluable. You know, I have a couple of decks that function that way where I need to keep that one attacking creature alive and being able to um, like turn that away from, from my super important piece, particularly for zero mana with the case of Deflecting Swat, but Bolt Bend is a single red to do the same thing. That's a really big deal. And there's even a couple other options to do the same thing. Wild Ricochet lets you copy a spell and redirect a spell. It costs a little bit more. It's four mana to do it. But um, being able to save your stuff is a pretty big deal in a lot of decks. So it's a way to do it. In Ricochet Trap, if someone casts a blue spell, you can cast it for free and basically use it to counter their counter spell. Hmm. Um, it's so, so. If you're playing one of those decks in, in, in red, um, in, you know, Joey, you have a Greven deck that you probably want to keep safe in plenty of situations. These spells are a way to do that in that kind of deck where you are going to be swinging at somebody for 25 damage that they absolutely let, can't let come through and you very badly want to have it come through. Can confirm Bolt Bend saves my bacon so often mm -hmm. in that deck. It's very, very important. You mentioned some personal favorite cards that I have in red. <laughs> Dana, could you possibly, possibly be referring to Pyroblast and Red Elemental Blast? I, I, I feel like the fact that you've used these on Sheldon Menory himself <laughs> probably... <laughs> makes them even higher status among your favorite cards? I mean, yes, it's really nice to destroy, you know, someone's random Atraxa because it happens to be blue, but it also feels really, really good to counter a Cyclonic Rift, everybody. It's so great. I totally, totally like these cards. But I also totally get that these are a bit niche, and even the redirection spells there are a little bit niche. Matt, are there any other effects that come to your mind when it comes to protecting your board in red? Well, I, I mean, I haven't cast this card, but I hear Tybalt's Trickery can be pretty <laughs> decent at doing this um, if you haven't read this card in its entirety you're not alone don't worry um, <laughs> we are out there take, take um, five or six minutes to set aside yes do pause the video go read Tybalt's trickery <laughs> um, but basically like it, it it's a counterspell of sorts um, but yeah, it, people just don't expect counter spells outside of blue. So like we mentioned with white, like when they do show up, they're just going to be highly impactful. Um, that's why Pyroblast and Red Elemental Blast, like Joey loves them so much because people just don't expect Pyroblast to come out of nowhere. Um, they're very much the John Cena of the red spells. <laughs> um, you, you, you don't see them and all of a sudden you do. 
Um, but yeah, so Temple's Trickery, just if, if we're going to mention red counter spells, I feel like the trickery is something we all should should, should be mentioning. I, I, I totally love it. That's probably the strongest protection effect of the ones we've mentioned so far, because that one actually stands a good chance of genuinely countering a wrath effect. There's another dynamic here that I do want to bring up that I know you guys are a little bit softer on, but I also really favor mutually assured destruction as a tactic to protect my board. So an enchantment like Vicious Shadows, which deals a bunch of damage to your opponents whenever your creatures die, or even like the dragon's mode on Outpost Siege, that is a pretty sizable deterrent, in my opinion, that is going to keep opponents from wanting to cast a Wrath effect in the first place. And I do think that that therefore deserves a mention here. If I've got a big board of tokens and one of those enchantments in play, our, my opponents probably don't want to cast that Wrath because they would just take so much damage that it just would not be worth casting. I tend to feel like those generally get used as offensive threats and any defensive work they do is kind of accidental. Um, but red doesn't have a lot of options and it, right. you know, anything that protects your board is pretty useful. Um, we had this conversation off air, but like we were wondering if there might well not be enough to just do a full show on mutually assured destruction. And there may <laughs> well be, so we're not going to delve too deeply into this, but it's mm. definitely something that you can do to keep protecting your stuff for sure. Yeah. We, we, we definitely had the, uh, had the debate behind closed doors of, well, is this actually a protection spell? Is this actually, um, so yeah, like it, Punisher pieces, stuff like that, like they can be used in some situations. It really just depends on the deck. Um, I'm not too keen on them, but some people out there, I'm, I'm sure, are building them that way. And if you are, that's awesome. Um, keep doing, keep doing you. Yeah, it, it's very, very effective. But you're right. We are a little bit slim on things that red is going to use to really protect its stuff because red's just so aggro that it usually doesn't care if its stuff dies because it's going to just bring a bunch of other stuff out. So that tends to be the usual dynamic that we see with red, which is why it pairs so beautifully with other very aggressive colors, such as green. Matt, red might not have been your, your, your hugest forte when it comes to those mutually assured destruction spells, but I feel like green, green is your cup of tea and you probably have a lot of thoughts about ways that green can keep its board around. Well, there's mutually assured destruction in green, um, as in, like, I'm just going to attack you with big creatures <laughs> and Pathbreaker Ibex people to death. So, yeah, the, everything, the destruction is definitely mutual there. Uh, but the, the spells that protect your board, um, this actually, green does it very, very well as well. I mean, Heroic Intervention is kind of the, the banner card for this effect. It's just two mana, one in a green. For instance, it makes all your creatures indestructible and hexproof until in turn. Um, it's... It's powerful, man. This is one of the, like, oh, it's so good, folks. There's probably no spell in the last five or six years that I've slept on more than Heroic Intervention when it first came out. Um, I remember reading through those spoilers, and, you know, we talked about how white always gets kind of that draft card that gives a creature plus two, plus two, and indestructible. Green tends to get the same thing. You know, target creature gets plus two, plus two, and indestructible, and fights a creature, or gets hexproof and plus one, plus one, or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's always one of those in every green set. And I remember when I saw Heroic Intervention, I kind of read it that way. I wasn't really paying attention. I just assumed that's what it was. And it wasn't until like four or five months later when someone and cast it against me in a commander game and i was like wait what does that do <laughs> hex proof and indestructible for your entire team um i felt so bad like i literally felt <laughs> bad that i didn't catch it the first time through because that card is insane in almost insane. any green deck well and, and dana it, it is possible that i undersold it too because i i said creatures right. yeah. um it's all your permits. it's everything all right. your permits yeah, it's your everything. entire battlefield oh yeah oh man that one's that one's absolutely ludicrous that whew. Yeah, that's that's certainly the poster child. But Matt, are there other options in green that you will maybe also like to use instead of just that one? Because I mean, well, it is big and famous. It, it is big. <laughs> I mean, it's the Teferi's protection of of the green spells and in, in this episode. So yeah, um, but asceticism is another great way just to give your entire battlefield uh, hexproof and regenerate creatures if you're able to. Sometimes, you know, a Wrath of God has the cannot be regenerated clause in there, um, but asceticism is a great way just to do all that and work around. Um, it's a really hard card to get rid of because it's an enchantment, so not every color can always deal with that. Um, give it a couple years, I'm sure they will be, but um, it's just a very resilient card. It makes your entire battlefield resilient. It's it's a wonderful card. I, I'm a big fan. Um, you know, similarly, we talk about regeneration not being maybe perfect, but it does the job a lot of times. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about regeneration is because they don't really print it anymore, that means 
we're probably not going to get many new cards that say creatures can't be regenerated. Um, so hmm. I, I think as time passes, you're going to see some of those things that will allow you to regenerate a board state maybe become a little more powerful because there's just not going to be things that work around that effect. And Wrap in Vigor is a green instant that regenerates your entire board is one of those. It's maybe a little underwhelming compared to Heroic Intervention, but as a backup plan, that's still pretty good regenerating an entire board. You know, yeah, Damnation and Wrath of God are going to hit it, but not every board wipe does. It's going to dodge plenty of those, or it's going to let you use your blockers to stop an Alpha Strike and then regenerate them all plenty of times, too. It's a really solid card. That one's not bad. I'm going to throw out a personal shout out here for Inspiring Call. This one's pretty specific to just plus one, plus one counter decks because it only gives the indestructibility to your plus one, plus one counter packed up creatures. But that's also just a really cool effect, too. And I kind of like finding those more specialized versions, not the like, oh, this does for all of the creatures the way that, you know, Heroic Intervention famously is just like, I'm good in all the scenarios. But finding the niche ones also feels really, really nice in the right deck. See, I, I'm going to give a shout out to all of our longtime listeners who Dana and I told you, Joey, to try that <laughs> card did. out many, yep, many really episodes on. ago. And so I'm very <laughs> glad to hear that you're you're adopting and listening to us finally. Um, yeah, it, all the, all the sage advice. Episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know. 179 episodes before I finally listened to you. But yes, that's awesome. Okay, so moving away now from green, let's ditch the colors entirely. Dana, I know that you like playing a whole bunch of artifacts out there. So when it comes to colorless sources of keeping your board alive, what are some artifact or colorless spells that you like to use? Uh, one that I'm a huge fan of is Veilstone Amulet. Um, it's a three mana artifact. And all it says is... Um, Whenever you cast a spell, creatures you control gain hexproof. Um, now, it, it feels a little bit like in a blue deck. I, I remember thinking, well, again, I'll just run counter spells. But the ability to turn every cantrip that you have in your deck into a counter spell, not a true counter spell, but like a way to prevent removal, I should say, is really, really useful in the right deck. And I found it's a super powerful effect, particularly because you can bait things out. People have to then decide, okay, is it worth trying to remove this thing because there's a couple mana available and is that person just going to cast an instant speed spell and, and give their thing hexproof? Um, th that's really, really powerful because it winds up being a thing that you don't have to actually pull the trigger. If people are scared you're going to pull the trigger, they might just not do their thing. Uh, I just am a big fan of this card now and I have it in a couple of different decks. That's a pretty spicy one. Matt, what about you? Um, so Cauldron of Souls is an oldie but a goodie. I think it's it depends on the decks, but um, it's a little expensive these days. Five mana for an artifact, um, and it's just tap it, and you can choose any number of target creatures, and those creatures gain undying until end of turn. So that means whenever they die, they come back with a minus one, minus one counter on it if it had no minus one, minus one counters on it when it died. Uh, it's not necessarily the most powerful spell anymore, but I have it in a couple decks these days, um, especially because like being able to just bring your entire board back, or if you need to use it politically, like you can make a deal mm -hmm. that, um, oh, your your reclamation sage can come back if you promise to blow up that problem thing over there. Um, that's definitely got some applications. Um, I'm a big fan of Cauldron of Souls. Um, just something to keep in mind because any deck can play it too. So if you don't have any options, it's worth a look. Yeah. Keep in mind there, you just mentioned Reclamation Sage, which is a 2-1. So the Persist, would it would come back as a 1-0 and immediately die. But you would get the you would get the ETB ability, though. Right, which is totally worth it. Mm -hmm. Totally worth it. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I also like this one. And if you do have some creatures that would come back as, you know, they've got a minus one counter on them, and then you, like, you blink them, and then the minus one counter goes away, you can repeatedly use the Cauldron of Souls. And I also think that's real nice. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, another one, I'm going to quick shout out here because I, I you know, had kind of forgot about it until we started doing this list. Eldrazi Monument mm. is a, a five mana artifact that gives your creatures indestructible. Um, and you have to sacrifice a creature during your upkeep to pay the, the upkeep cost on it, or you have to sacrifice it. Um, I had a friend that used to run this in a token deck. And by a token deck, I mean all his token decks because that's all he played. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a little bit um, easy to underestimate this card. Yes, it gives yourself indestructible, 
Um, but there were so many games when I would think I was fine because I had a handful of blockers out and the math that changes when suddenly they all get flying and they all get plus one plus O oh and indestructible. Um, it's a great defensive tool, but again, it's one of those tools that offensively, it just kills people sometimes. That so card. in the right deck, this is an absolute beast of a card. I, I played that. I play Eldrazi Monument in my Titania deck because I am constantly spitting out tons and tons of creatures. Eldrazi Monument is the truth. When you are, mm-hmm. you've got tons of tokens to sacrifice. It does not matter. I will pay that cost all the time. If I get evasion on my stuff, a nice, lovely buff, and also you can't destroy the board. This thing, it's so good. Play Eldrazi. It's, it's so good. You don't realize how good plus one plus zero is on creatures until there's 14 of them with flying and destructible coming it's your way. It's so, so dang good. I want to shout out a curious one here that I just felt had to be mentioned because we are talking about artifacts. Do y'all know Colfenor's Urn? This one's only showing up in like 750 decks, but it's so weird that I felt like we had to put it in this episode. It's a three mana artifact that says whenever a creature you control with toughness four or greater dies, you can exile it. And then at the end of turn, and that's end of any turn, keep in mind, If three or more cards have been removed from the game with the urn, you sacrifice the urn and then put all of those creatures back into play under their owner's control. So if you've got some really big creatures that you want to keep around and you are afraid of them dying, Kolfelnor's urn can get them all back for you, which I think is pretty cool utility. And since it's colorless, it can go anywhere. You know, Joey, I've never heard of that card. Um, I would have expected Dana to be the one to suggest it. Um, it is <laughs> it is back from Lorwyn, which apparently has been a while, but um, that is an interesting card. I, I like the idea of being able to, to load that up and then bring everything back. Um, it's a very, very necromancer thing of you to suggest, but hey. um, I do like this suggestion. That, that's, that's pretty solid. Awesome. And I just checked, Matt. You said it was a while ago. Lorwyn came out in 1972. So yeah, we, we, we <laughs> forgot how much time has passed, but it was, yeah, it's almost 40 years. That, that was the best year for Dodge Chargers. <laughs> I hear. <laughs> right, yeah. The sarcasm in sports will be finished. We will move on now if that's where we're at. We talked about some colorless cards. Let's move now to our final category. Those are the multicolored cards. So they are a bit more specific, but that also means they usually tend to pack a lot more punch. Matt, talk to us about some of your favorite multicolored cards to use to save your board. Well, I've, I've gone on this podcast many times and, you know, shouted praises on the charm cycle. It's any charms, really. Um, But Boros Charm and Golgari Charm, both of those are just great, fantastic tools for saving your board, um, for having a whole bunch of other uses. If you watch over at twitch.tv slash EDHRecast, you'll see the Boros Charm that was heard around the world um, (laughs) when I was able to finish a game with it. It's like, it's just, Boros Charm just has the the mode of being able to make all of your creatures indestructible for a, a white and a red mana. Golgari Charm regenerates all of your creatures for the same thing for a green and a black mana. Plus, you're able to destroy um, a whole bunch of permanents, able to give minus one, minus one to the battlefield. Like, there's so many different uses in all these charms, but Golgari Charm and Boros Charm always are finding so many slots in decks. I would argue they're two of the more powerful charms that exist in Magic, um, just because those two, char- the, the two modes, I should say, that we're mentioning are so incredibly powerful. They are very much kind of the platonic ideal of charms where Mm. all of the modes are almost always useful at most points in the game. Like they're just really, really good and you never feel bad about using whichever one you're using. I'm I'm totally on board with that. I'm going to shout out a multicolored card that has completely won me over because I've watched my mom use it in her flying tribal deck. That's Linvala Shield of Seagate, which is just a creature sort of like Selfless Spirit that you can sacrifice to give your creatures indestructible or hexproof for the turn. That is a very, very potent ability. That is going to be really, really helpful. It's a bit more proactive, but that also means that you can reanimate it, Matt, like you mentioned, with Selfless Spirit earlier. So that's another card that I didn't expect to like very much, but the more I see it in the 99, the more and more it impresses me to the point that it's not just my mom playing it in her decks. She's convinced me I got to be playing it in mine too. Yeah, um, it's a it's one of those cards that I, I think... Um, you don't appreciate just reading it and it, it plays much better than it reads. When you actually see it atop a deck, um, it's much scarier than it lo- than it is when you're just looking at the card and trying to figure out if it's good or not. Mm-hmm. Dana, do you have any favorites? Um, Privet's position um, is is kind of a Selesnia asceticism, um, except for it protects all of your stuff by giving it hexproof. 
Um, that is a really good card that also has not a reprint since 1972 in the Warwind block, <laughs> I don't think. Um, um, but yeah, like if, if you have access to those colors and you are playing a deck that cares about permanence, which Selesnya decks tend to do, um, that's a fantastic protection piece because it, it then puts that position, that, that, that situation out there where someone's looking at the board state and they're like, okay, I need to deal with this next turn. Then the person drops that privileged position and suddenly you're like, I can't do anything now until that's gone. So instead of like dealing with the problem, I have to deal with that before I can get to the problem. And mm-hmm. adding that extra layer in place makes it really difficult to interact with somebody's board state in a way that you may need to do to keep from losing that game. Uh, Dana, you know, as the resident Solisnia player, I, I do appreciate that card. I'm going to throw out another one, too. Um, I, I feel like I'd be doing myself a disservice if I didn't mention Dauntless Escort. Oh, yeah. Especially since I already talked about Selfless Spirit when they're they're roughly the same card. Um, you can sacrifice Dauntless Escort to make all your creatures indestructible. Um, just a 3-3 three, three for 3 mana, um, which already is like the type of card I love playing anyways. Um, so, yeah, if, you, if you're playing Selfless Spirit, if you're in green-white, um, you probably want to consider Dauntless Escort just because it's an extra copy. And if something is usually good enough to be included once, you might want to consider including a second copy of it. And this is just that. That is just that. There are, coming to mind, like, well, there are a whole bunch of creatures that can save your board. That, like, oh, like Flash ones like Archangel Avacyn, for example, can enter and give all of your stuff indestructible too. And I think, to me, one of the most important aspects of this whole category of protecting your board is the redundancy of ways that you have to do it. Because just one of these spells can be a really well-timed blowout, it's true, but actually having multiple versions of these in your deck can guarantee that you actually get them to your hand more often, which allows you to dare to extend onto the battlefield in the first place. And I feel like that's just a huge aspect of what makes this such an important category is that having more versions of this effect in your deck just kind of allows you to line up the place where these cards are good in the first place, if that makes any sense. Yeah, putting yourself in that position to succeed or or be able to ha- be at that that much stronger of a position than everyone else is a huge part of what takes one a game. Would you say that that position is rather privileged, privileged. Dana? A privileged I, I there would, it is. I would, oh, Matt. Uh, okay, perfect. <laughs> you are silly. But but yeah, it's just like, seriously, I do think it's like a huge important factor of this entire discussion, this entire topic, is that the ability to, you know, know that you stand a good chance of drawing one of these cards kind of gives you carte blanche, gives you the confidence to go and actually put stuff onto the battlefield. So I feel like that's just a, a huge important thing when it comes to protecting your board is knowing how many of those effects you've actually got in the 99. But now, fellas, as we come to a close on this episode, I do have one final question for you. What do you think about the cases where you failed? What happens if you didn't manage to protect the board? Like, are there things that are good for rebuilding after a huge setback? What do you think? I mean, I think this sounds like an entirely different podcast episode. Um, there's the the world of rebuilding after a board wipe or just how to play around them. Um, that sounds like an entirely different episode. So I, I suggest, and I hope Dana backs me up here, um, because I have no better answer other than um, let's talk about that next week. Uh, that sounds like a good plan to me. You know what? I think that's fair because you're right. That is a pretty complicated question and it probably depends on the specific strategies that you're using because just like we saw with all of these different board protection spells, a lot of them can be very strategy specific. So Matt, that's a great call. See, I'm still listening to you after 179 that, episodes. Perfect. It's, it's working. I mean, it, it, it only <laughs> took three and a half years, but here we are. Here we are. All right, fellas, this was so much fun to talk about, and thank you so much for joining me. But if our listeners would like to get in touch with us now, where is it that they can find us all? Matt? Well, you can listen to me, listeners, over at Mathemus55 on Twitter. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we are streaming games over at twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast. Um, so make sure you tune in because our guests are always awesome. We have a super, super great time. Um, the guests, uh, oh man, so many great guests, like CAG members, rules committee members, just great people in the community. It's it's always super fun. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach. You can hear me on my other podcast, CMDR Central. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and for Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH
And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter, and you can find the cast at EDH Fretcast on both Facebook and Twitter as well. Plus, if you've got a question, you can contact us at EDHRetcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to the whole team at the Command Zone for handling the post-production work on the podcast, and we want to thank our sponsors once again, too. They are TCG Player and CardKingdom.com, and you can visit Altersleeves.com slash EDHRetcast for cool, custom EDH Rec sleeves. Listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights but until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. <laughs> <laughs>